Thank you very much for that beautiful song. It really prepares us for true worship. Truly, unless we have experienced his loving kindness, his salvation, our praise and worship will be really empty. You know, it is very important for us to understand how precious, how gracious, how merciful our God is, what our condition was, and what he has accomplished in our life. Only then our mouth will be filled with praise and worship to him all the days of our life. Now, the Lord also is seeking true worshipers. As we read in uh, John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, but the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now we have uh, read this verse many a times, and you know, we really understand the Lord is seeking such to worship, to worship with understanding. Now, sometimes, you know, it is important to get a clearer picture of what it means to worship him in truth and in spirit. We may have to look on the other side of the coin, you know, because uh, worship has been going on for a long time. There are many people who are worship, who worship, you know, some may be worshiping idols, some may be worshiping, you know, something else. As uh, Paul saw in Athens, they are worshiping unknown God, so, you know. And uh, a picture also is given, even God's people, you see the Pharisees, for example, you see, uh, they are also really thinking that they are worshiping. But, uh, is, was that worship, was that worship really acceptable to God? Because there's something that was missing there. That's why, you know, God is saying, now is the time that God desires people to worship him in truth and in spirit. So just let us think about it for a minute. You know, the Lord always uh, taught people in parables and, uh, the Word of God records many instances where uh, real worship is given to him, which is acceptable to the Lord. You know, if you turn with me to Luke and chapter 7. And verse 36 onwards. Here's a story of a Pharisee also trying to honor God, trying to honor Jesus. And there's a sinner who has come. And this it's a contrast, you know, given to us for us to really understand the mind of the Pharisee who's, you know, who are supposed to be, you know, very religious people. You know, the Pharisees are the people who uh, really, you know, give a lot of stress and importance to, you know, traditions and uh, ceremonies and rites. So, you know, such are the Pharisees. But, you know, those things are really not A very pleasing to Luke chapter 18 because you know the Lord always taught in, in
And there is a path also now to certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as others men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So this is the parable that the Lord has recorded for us. You know, parables are all, it says, you know, the Lord always spoke in parables so that we may really understand the very simple things. But you know, many a times, even though the parables were told, the disciples could not understand. Now, I hope as we read this parable also, we may really understand what desires us to learn from it. Because, you know, we may also be like this uh, Pharisee, thinking very highly about ourselves. Maybe we are very religious. Maybe we, you know, attend all the meetings. Maybe we may be sharing the word also. Maybe we may be doing everything. You know, so it is a kind of a thing we have to really examine ourselves because, you know, it is really given to us to understand that we really are absolutely unworthy people. You know, because God's word says we are unprofitable servants because there is nothing good in us that can merit salvation to us. There is nothing good in us that merits his care and love for us. There is really nothing good for us. In nothing, no one can really claim that I know I am worthy for all this. You know, it is just by God's grace and his mercy that we have been saved. As we also read, you know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it is by the grace of God we are saved. Nothing of ourselves, nothing of our good works. So, no, even though we read this many a times, we see that we may, we can have a pharisaical attitude in our life, thinking that, you know, we are superior than others. But, you know, it is only by the grace of God that we have been saved. And how important it is to really understand when we really understand that then only we will be able to bring a worship that is pleasing to God. Then only, you know, our hearts will truly come to acknowledge all that he has done to us in truth. That the truth for us to understand, as he says, you no, know, those who must worship him in truth. What is the truth we understand? The truth of our horrible condition before we know God. The truth of our life. You see, many people cannot understand this very fact that we are all sinners. You know, we all think that we are very good people. We are very moral people. Maybe we have been, you know, raised in a very uh, good uh, Christian home and have a good moral character. As it was in my own case also, we used to think, you know, we are really good people. My mother used to always say, son, you must confess your sin. I used to wonder what is she talking about? I didn't do this, I don't do that, I am okay. I used to think like that, you know, but God's word only convicted me that I am a sinner because God's standard is so high. Even we look at a woman with the lustful eyes, we have already committed sin, it says. You know, even if it, we have any covetousness, it says covetousness is idolatry. So, you know, we really, when we really examine ourselves, there is nothing good in us. Only when we really consider, you know, our true condition, what we were, God's word very clearly says, when we are enemies of him, he sent his only begotten son. When we are sinners, he sent his son to die for us. So it is only when we come to that understanding, truly then we can, you know, worship him in truth and in spirit. Now if we turn to Luke chapter 7, as this picture is given to us, the real contrast of, uh, you know, how, you know, the picture is given to us so that we may understand 
the mind of the Pharisee, the mind of the person, you know, who thinks that he is really a godly person. No, the Pharisees are the people who really were thinking that they are, they, they are a very religious sect, no doubt. They had a lot of knowledge about God's words. The, the law was given to them and they are experts in all that. And you see the result of all that, you know, as we read uh, in uh, chapter 7, verse 36 onwards. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. You know, this picture is given actually in the, as you read earlier, this is in the town of Naim, where, you know, the Lord has done a great wonder. And uh, maybe the Pharisee, you know, is also interested. He has heard about so many things about the Lord, and he wants to really see for himself. And he thinks that he is a good judge. And, you know, and he's uh, invited him to really, you know, he's just curious to know about him. And you know that, you know, how all the Pharisees, you know, they, they really scorned him. They really wanted to kill him. They wanted to find fault with him. <coughs> so this story, you know, is recorded for us to really understand. In the verse 37 says, And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. You see, he's even calling him master. But you know, he is real. that is not, he is really, you know, it is all words. See, this is what we really have to see how, you know, the man is pretending, man is, you know, thinking in his own mind. He is not, a, he is not a prophet. If he had known, he would have known she is a sinner. Because that is the mindset. But now let's continue. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to you. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he, to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but the woman, this woman, since the time I came and hath not ceased to kiss my feet, my head with oil, thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat sit with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Now it's a wonderful incident. Now this is not a parable, but this is a real incident that happened. Just for us to understand, you know, really if we think we are really good people and all that, you know, and many we just take, you know, salvation for granted, then our worship also will be empty. Worship also will be a poor kind of worship. But if we really understand, you know, how much the Lord has loved us, what our true condition really was, you know, it is very hard for people to really understand that. Because I know that uh, one, you know, it's a Sister Bhargavi was sharing uh, the testimony and the father was there. Father himself said, he's sharing his testimony, you know, that... Uh, when he really resented, uh, resented, and you know, 
uh, did not want her children to really know the Lord, but they were all they were entreating him to go and uh, listen to one uh, come to a meeting, and uh, the preacher looked at him, and one word he said, "You are a sinner," and that is the word really touched his heart. Till that time, he is thinking he is not a sinner. He is thinking that you know he comes from a very rich tradition uh, of people who are supposed to be of a higher caste who are really chosen, you know, and that is the kind of understanding. But to know when he said, you are a sinner, that touched his heart. And he's truly, then he realized that he is a sinner. And God brought to his attention all the sins that, you know, he has done to confirm in his own mind. What a wretched sinner. We really are when we really think of, you know, and, you know, just to think, you know, how many times we have disobeyed God, how many times we have, you know, uh, doing our own thing. But God is so merciful. God is so gracious, you know. So when we really consider that, you know, how much he had to, how much he has to pay for our redemption, that he gave his own son to die for you and me. You see, that is when we really come to such an understanding. Then only, you know, we will be able to, you know, praise the Lord, worship the Lord. And, you know, it is true that uh, such, a, such a mind, you know, change of mindset is very essential when we really, you know, want to praise the Lord, you know, and we, we see, you know, when we read uh, Psalm uh, 34, verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So the psalmist is able to tell this, you know, his praise, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You know, that is the true understanding of what the Lord is to us, to us. What the Lord is to a person. What the Lord has been to this psalmist. You know, so that is the kind of understanding. This was the psalm of David. And, you know, David has gone through many experiences. And you know that David was not a saint. You know, he was a man who committed, you know, adultery, who committed uh, murder, so nothing. So there's nothing, you know, he was destined to go to hell only, but, you know, because he confessed, he was forgiven. And not only forgiven, he was elevated and he was blessed so abundantly. And, you know, even when his uh, enemies have surrounded him, and, you know, when he cried to the Lord, he, the Lord has, uh, you know, uh, rescued him, the Lord has helped him. So it all these experiences of life, he's able to really, you know, put it in this wonderful psalm. And that's why he's able to say, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be my mark. So we have to really understand what has been our experience in life. Really, do we really meditate on all that we, uh, the Lord has done for us? What we were before and how he has, how many times we have really failed him? How many times, you know, still we come to him, and when we come to him, his word really has assured us when we confess he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, such a wonderful, loving, gracious, heavenly father is to us. And what a savior he has given to us. You know, his word tells us, you know, as we read in, you know, Romans 8.32, this word actually, you know, always, you know, amazes me. He says, you know, I didn't spare my own son to die for you. How will, you not, how will I not give you all things? You know, such wonderful love of the Father. And the very privilege that, you know, we can call Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, is no small favor, is no small thing. So, you know, how our life must be a life, really, you know, a life to bring glory and honor to Him. You see, many a times, you know, we miss the blessings because we are all, selfish people we miss the blessing we we fail to really recognize you know we may also tend to become like a pharisaical that you know that uh, we may uh, just think that you know we are doing all things right but you know many times even after believing him uh, even after knowing him we still do many things wrong but god is so gracious you know he brings us into this wonderful relationship that we can call him our heavenly father. So, you know, as, a, if a, if, as an earthly father, if our child does think something wrong, do we disinherit them? No, 
we will counsel them we will encourage them we will uh, you know uh, you know we if we continually we have to, uh, chastisement may also come god's word says he will also chastise us if because he we are his children you no know, he wants only good of us but you know if we are really very uh, you know careful in our life if we really understand you know what his purpose is for you and me then you know we live a life that is really totally totally committed to him you know many a times we think that you know we can do many things in our own uh, strength in our own ways but how good it is to really depend upon him then you know he is the able to do all things uh, you know he says uh, verse 8 of the psalm 34 it says oh taste and see the lord is good blessed is the man that trusteth in him so you know it's a life is a challenge of how we may trust in him how we may look to him and then you know we know that our lord will never fail he is able to do all things his word says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think such a great god we are we have and yet many a times you know we depend upon our own and we are uh, going our own way missing all the blessing that uh, god wants to give us you know and many a times we get into trouble but you know the verse of verse says i sought the lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears see david also was a man who was a man of god but he had to face many challenges in life many fears because enemies are always around him many is are trying to bring him down so we may really understand that you know it is god's purpose that how we may really be able to you know praise him worship him when we really trust in him when we know that what he has done what he has accomplished for us his uh, his desire to bless us is beyond our comprehension he says my desire is only to bless and not to bring evil to you so that that's how his thoughts towards us are only for good so when we really consider these things you know then we will be able to bring a worship that is uh, you know really pleasing to him god has also you know reminded us also you know what he thinks of the pharisees he says you know be uh, beware of the 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 leaven of the pharisees pharisees it says you know because of their and you know there are a lot of uh, things are written about uh, pharisees we 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 know that you know it is the uh, for us to really understand they are very self righteous people you know what he is thinking about pharisees if you read in matthew chapter 23 verse 23 onwards maybe somebody can uh, help to read that matthew chapter 23 verse 23 onwards to 27 Okay. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise the cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish but inside they they are full of extortion and self indulgence blind pharisee first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also what to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead dead man's bones and all uncleanness even so you also outwardly appear righteous to man but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness o to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites is that enough uncle okay i'll just you know this is you know brother i just want to say one more thing you know just that he says you know these are the people who know the law and they pay, tell people about the law but they don't do it themselves that is the thing you know so we we just have to be you know we have to really examine ourselves our we know the law we know the desires of the lord he has given us exactly how we may live as his children because we are representatives of him so you know we are ambassadors of him
So, you know, we reflect our Lord Jesus Christ. We reflect him. And so, you know, we have to be careful in our life. So in other words, you know, what I want to say is that, you no, know, how we may really, you know, be conscious of the purpose of God, what he has done in our life. And so we come. The only thing, you know, without, uh, you see, you may do a wonderful, uh, you may want to do a wonder, you want to, you know, those who are good cooks and all that may understand that, you know, you want to cook something really good. But uh, maybe if you want to do biryani and, you know, make everything good, but uh, if the meat is missing, that is no biryani, right? You, you may call it a meat biryani, but it, so it is really for us to understand that, you know, when we really come to worship the Lord, if we don't understand that, you know, what our true condition was and what the Lord has done for us, if that is not there, then, you know, our worship will be empty worship. So that is why, you know, the Lord has instituted us something very important for us. The table is a reminder of the great price that was paid for our redemption. So that is why, you know, we have asked to take part in the table, you know, examining ourselves. What is it we examine? It says, you know, examine yourself how your faith is. You know, that's why, that's what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourself. See, what is our condition? What we were, are we still, you know, living like the Pharisees, you know, thinking that, oh, we are, we are very righteous people. No, we are really nothing. Don't look to others, you know, the, that uh, don't think that we are all good. It are, we are saved only by the grace of God. It is the gift. God's word says, you know, in, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So our wages, all life, would have resulted only in the death and destruction and hell. But the gift of God is eternal life given to us. So we have to examine ourselves as we, before we take part in the Lord's table. You know, this is the thing that the Lord instituted himself. So because he knows our failures, he knows uh, how weak we are. So it is a reminder for us to give. And if we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll uh, read a few verses. Verse 23 onwards, it says that the Lord Jesus, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered it unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So just imagine it's a saying, the body, his body was broken for you and me. It is for our sake that he went on the cross. It is for our sake he who knew no sin took upon himself all our sins. It is for our sake that he took the punishment of the cross. That is what this word is reminding us. It's telling us to always remember. It is not because of our goodness that we are saved, but it is because he took upon himself all our sins. And he says, you know, take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is the New Testament. This is the new covenant he has given to us. This is the agreement he has given to us, that he shed his precious blood. He gave his life. The blood, you know, is the representative of our life. He, the, the life is in the blood. So, you know, he shed his precious blood and gave his life that we may have abundant life, that we may have eternal life, that we may have a blessed life. All this he has done, not because we deserve anything, but because of his love for you and me, because of the grace that is the unmerited love that he has for you and me, the Father has for you and me, and the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience to the Father has all this, that he is our savior. So when we really understand that, you know, then only every time we remember that, every time we are, you know, take part in the Lord's table, we may remember the great price paid for our redemption. We may remember the pain and the shame that should have been ours. You know, if we were not saved, it would be in hell even worse than, you know, it is, it never, it never ends. The torture never ends in, in hell. The Lord Jesus Christ, you know, endured that uh, 
separation from the Lord for a short time for you and me. That's why he said, oh, uh, why have you forsaken me? He says, you know, because that is the time, you know, the Lord was, uh, you know, away from the Father because that is the thing, you know, when we are in sin, we are away from him. But we thank God that, you know, he has, uh, uh, he has paid for our redemption and now we are brought together to be with uh, to be his children to be the children of the almighty god god's word very clearly says you know in john chapter 1 verse 12 says to them who believe on him he gives the power to become the children of god so we can understand how great is the salvation given to us how great are the promises given to us how great is his uh, you know uh, uh, patience towards us how great is his mercy towards us you know but for his mercy we would have uh, perished long time ago it just we read that so we know, we understand that, you know, God is so gracious. So before we take part in the Lord's table, let us examine ourselves and then take part in the Lord's table. Shall we all, you know, close our eyes, look to the Lord as we pray to him. Almighty, loving and merciful God, we come into thy holy presence and thank you, Lord, for the table set before us, the table, O Lord, that reminds us of your everlasting love towards us. This table that reminds us, O Lord, that you gave your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven for us to, O oh Lord, sustain ourselves in our spiritual life. The bread of heaven, the bread of heaven, O oh Lord, the heavenly bread that you've given to us, O oh Lord, that we may have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your word assures us for those who believe, you know, as we read in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, Whosoever believeth on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, we thank you. Your word is eternal word. And, O oh Lord, your word, O oh Lord, stands forever. Lord, we know that when we believe in you, when we believe that you gave your son to die for us, and he not only was crucified, he was buried and rose again. When we believe that, your word assures us of salvation, assures us of forgiveness of sins, assures us of uh, a wonderful, O uh, oh Lord, uh, inheritance that we have, a wonderful, uh, oh Lord, uh, um, privilege that we have to call thee our heavenly father and oh Lord. So we just thank you, Lord. Help us to really understand, oh Lord, what wonders you have done for us as we take part of this bread and this cup that reminds us of the precious blood of Lord Jesus Christ that was shed and for the remission of our sins. Lord Jesus, help us to take part worthily, oh Lord, for we acknowledge, oh Lord, we are unworthy. Our worthiness only comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, Lord. Let each and every one examine, help us to examine ourselves, O Lord, and to understand how great is the salvation given to us so freely. Lord, truly, as your word reminded us, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The gift is never, O Lord, uh, worked for. It is a free gift you have given to us. Though we are undeserving, yet your love is everlasting. We thank you, we praise you, Lord. 